Jim, let's say I am a new artist and I'm thinking about recording uh, some music and I'm, I want to put together a plan about uh, perhaps how I should record in terms of coordinating that with uh, the promotion of the marketing. So I'm sitting at the kitchen table here. What are the things that I should consider? Well, uh, the most important thing to uh, consider is, uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, your music. You know, you should really have all of that together uh, before you set one foot in the studio and record one note. And uh, it's important to, uh, under uh, to understand today that uh, uh, you have to think like a producer, uh, especially today where there are a prolifer there is a proliferation of artist recorded self produced projects so you know going back in time uh, you know the heyday of the jazz recording 50s and 60s you know when you went into the studio and you, uh, for prestige or blue note or impulse uh, there's usually, and I'm sure, you know, all jazz fans and aficionados everywhere, uh, you know, are familiar with the names Orrin Keep News or Bob Thiel and Michael Cascuna, you know, producers who uh, uh, coordinate everything about a session. So uh, they're responsible for uh, assisting the artist in assembling uh, the musicians, the material, uh, the whole. Uh, you know everything that's involved in making the recording so uh, when you're out there on your own self-producing you know you have to think like a producer so that you can uh, avoid a lot of costly mistakes down the line okay well uh, you mentioned mistakes what would be some of those mistakes what are some of the obstacles that an artist might have in, in developing and implementing self-promotion well studio time costs money so, you know, you don't want to go in the studio and you're not prepared. So it's always good to go out and do a bunch, you know, work your music out in advance of going into the studio. And when you get there, especially when you're recording, you know, uh, you know jazz or blues, or, uh, you know, most of the sessions today are done on a budget. And a lot of the budget is eaten up by the studio time. And the mixing, the mastering, and then of course the you know the you know the actual manufacturing of the CD. So it's good to really work your music, work your concept out. Have you know give a lot of thought to your concept of the recording because uh, that you know your marketing plan for a recording actually begins before you even record one note of music. So giving a lot of thought to that in advance is really going to be a big advantage for you after you have the music recorded and you're ready to promote it. Now Jim, when you say a concept for a recording, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, you know, whether you're going into the studio, and I'm sure, you know, Dave and Janice and PJ are actually three good examples uh, of uh, artists who have self-produced and have given a lot of thought to the concept. And each one of these artists uh, uh, are uh, have done that with their new recordings and uh, uh, but I'll just say a little bit about that and maybe you know Janice and Dave and PJ could uh, you know chime in here and say how they work their process but uh, a concept for the recording would be well all right uh, you know I'm going you know I, I have this open Magnus that I've been working on for a long time and I really want to document that you know what is it what story does the uh, the music tell? Are they original compositions, or am I telling as if you're a vocalist and you're picking material if it's original or standards? What's the uh, what's the underlying theme of the of the recording, and and is it does it function as a whole after it's done? And I you know I won't get too far into sequencing and mastering, although that plays a really large part in the success or a failure of a recording, and we could talk about that a little bit later. But maybe uh, Janice would like to jump in here and, and talk a little bit about uh, what kind of thought went into uh, her concept for her new recording. Okay, well, we're going to go with everybody here. Janice, what, uh, what do you have to say about how you put that together? Well, um, conceptually, uh, I was going for um, 
it, this is actually a continuation of a trend or, or a direction I've been going in for some while, which is to break out of the um, typical vocalist singing standards and then stepping back while everybody else improvises. And so I've been yearning to uh, embed myself in a, in a band uh, more like a horn would, uh, like an instrumentalist. Okay. Uh, we've lost Janice Temporary. We've lost Janice Temporary. Are you back? Uh, she's frozen. I guess she's in Naperville. It's rather cold frozen there. Frozen in time. Frozen okay. in time. <laughs> let's, let's jump over to PJ. We'll come back to Janice in a minute. PJ, you're a new artist. How do you, <coughs> excuse me. How do you deal with this developing a concept and doing the recording? Um, well, the first thing I think for me was I had to realize that my job was to figure out the music and leave the promotion and stuff like that to Jim. Um, so that was the first first big hurdle I had to realize was focus on what what I was good at, which was you know coming up with music. Um, and for me, uh, I, I released two albums in the past year, and for the first one, it was my very first uh, recording, um, and I. I specifically, I knew going into it that I did not want to do what I had seen a lot of great musicians do, which was release an album introducing your name here with a bunch of standards that they play incredible stuff on, um, because I just knew that there was no way if I released that, you know, the world has enough great guitar players, um, you know, Dave obviously among them and many others, and I wasn't going to stand out if I released an album that said introducing PJ Rasmussen and played over Confirmation or other great, great music, which I respect, but the world didn't need me to say that, so my my thought was uh, to go for all original music right out of the gun and try and focus on a group sound, um, and then when we did the follow-up album, I took the same concept. I went with all original music again and really wanted to focus on the compositional aspect because I feel like uh, something that gets lost in jazz sometimes with so much improvisation and so much talent in that area. Um, I feel like sometimes if the focus is so much on, you know, a 30-second head, then we're going to blow for five minutes and play another 30-second head out. I feel like that short changes some of the music. I really wanted to make bring a compositional approach in uh, for the second album. Um, and I think that can do a lot in terms of bringing people into the music who wouldn't necessarily otherwise listen to jazz. So that was uh, a big part of my concept for the most recent album. Okay. Now, Dave Stryker, you've got a number of albums under your belt. You're on the scene. Uh, you've got some uh, recognition factor here. Uh, in terms of your new recording, I believe it's called 8-Track, uh, before you set about doing the recording, did you do any thinking about uh, how you're going to promote it and how you're going to market it? Well, I've done a lot of uh, records. Uh, I've been unfortunate for the last, uh, since I started recording my first record in 1988 uh, for a Japanese label, and then I got with a Danish label, Steeplechase, and I was uh, done very many records for them. I think I did over maybe over 20 records for them. So I've done so many different projects from... Uh, all originals to standards, trio to big band, and uh, different different things. Uh, so this new one um, is uh, called Eight Track, which um, for me is a little unusual in that I actually have like a, a little hook on this one. And uh, you know, I wanted to run it by Jim and and maybe Brett too. Um, if I don't know if this is the greatest business move, but I'm only going to be releasing it on Eight Track. So I don't I don't know if that's um, I wanted to run that by you guys, you know. You <laughs> yes. Think you know, they're talking about vinyl coming back, but I'm thinking that uh, I want to bring the the plastic eight tracks. And you know, uh, you know, I understand Brett. I think Premack. I can really turn the industry around here. I understand Brett Premack has a convertible, and he's known for uh, dashing around town. He's a man about town, and uh, I could just see Brett cranking up the eight track with eight with Dave Stryker's eight track on there. <laughs> yeah. good idea. Good, it's and, a good and idea. The, you have to stick the matchbook in there to get it to work. <laughs> I, I just have a question. What's an eight track? Uh, uh, right. <laughs> exactly. So that's a good question. Anyway, so, as I was saying, um, 
I, this is a project that I've been wanting to do for a while. Like when I would play gigs, I would sometimes throw in these tunes, um, which is a long tradition in in jazz. At least when I grew up, the older guys they would play like pop tunes and jazz them up. It's uh, and so uh, that's what I've kind of done here. And I would do it on gigs and say, uh, "This is going to be from my next record." Dave plays the hits of the eight track, and everybody'd laugh. And then my wife was like, "You should do that." And so I decided, what the heck, you know, um, I, I, I've started to do uh, my own records now, my own label, and I said, let me do this. This has got a, a, you know, for me, it's got a little angle to it, and uh, I'm pretty happy with it. And as always, uh, I take care of the music, and then I turn it over to Jim to, uh, you know, to help me get it out there in the world. 